The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant us by that same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in its consolation. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. Hello and welcome to another live edition of What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley. With me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He is a traditional Catholic priest of the Society of St. Pius V. He also serves as the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Northwood, Ohio. So, Father, how are you tonight? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. Still fine. Good to see Still you. Fine. You too, Father. <laughs> uh, Father, we... Um, wanted to, uh, well, I guess first, would you want to start with any other prayer requests? That you have? Uh, actually, yes. I said we'd post names. Um, there are some urgent uh, urgent intentions, though. Dwayne Harris is very ill, and uh, pray for him and his wife, Mary Agnes. Okay, they're suffering. Uh, please also keep in your prayers. Susan Gorey will be undergoing eye surgery tomorrow, as well as Livia Lorenzano also. Please pray for her dear Livia. And uh, pray for Tom Wright and his family. And, of course, uh, continue your prayers, ardent prayers, for Paul Riley. And for, his, this, for his family, we pray that Paul will recover from the catastrophic accident that, uh, that he suffered uh, months ago. And uh, please keep in your prayers, uh, dear lady, uh, Margaret Zanoni Nelson. This would be her 94th birthday, actually. So please uh, keep her in your prayers also. And, uh, there are many, many others. And uh, we will again be giving you as comprehensive a list as we can on the, uh, on the website. Very good. Uh, thank you, Father. We uh, wanted, to, um, wanted to spend some time addressing uh, an article that was, um, we've, of course, known about for some time, but uh, just mm -hmm. recently one of our uh, very avid viewers brought this to our attention. He said uh, some of the claims in this article he found uh, rather compelling, and uh, on his based on his personal experience, he says he uh, he finds a lot of these uh, arguments uh, somewhat of a, a stumbling block for many uh, would be traditional Catholics um, and their their view of the Society of Saint Pius V. And the the article I'm I'm uh, referencing here is uh, by the late Father Anthony Chicada, and uh, I believe it's titled Bishop Mendez SSPV and Hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And uh, when one reads through that <clears throat> that article by Father Chicada, um, there are a great many claims made against uh, Bishop Mendez, the late uh, Bishop Mendez, who consecrated uh, Bishop Kelly um, of the uh, Society of Saint Pius V. But um, there are too many charges to. Uh, to to go through each and every one of these, Father. But uh, I think perhaps one of the one of the main uh, charges that Father Chicada brings up against Bishop Mendez, and I think the main one that uh, that our viewer references is uh, this claim that uh, I think it was in 1974 Bishop Mendez uh, hand selected his successor to his diocese in Puerto Rico, uh, consecrated this man a bishop to succeed him, and uh, this man was in fact a known homosexual, and. Uh, our viewer um, says that, that many, and uh, following Father Chicada in this article, kind of says that, uh, well, this is exactly the argument that the Society of St. Pius V makes against Archbishop Took uh, and his, his consecration, saying that he did the same thing, consecrated a known homosexual, and therefore uh, a traditional Catholic can have nothing to do with him, nothing to do with consecrations uh, that he performed. Um, is there any truth to this father did bishop mendez actually do such a thing if he did um is there any parallel between what he did and what uh archbishop took did actually tom uh father she got his entire article and i do pray for his soul i, I want him to save his soul with father dolan same thing i pray for them both in fact i just recently offered mass for him um 
But this is one of those things that causes me a great worry uh, about Father Jakarta's state of mind, honestly. Um, uh, what was his state of mind? He says so. I mean, you, you mentioned this, uh, this story about Bishop Mendez consecrating this homosexual successor of his in the Diocese of Arecibo. And that was added to this lengthy, lengthy diatribe of Father Chicada against Bishop Mendes, right? Yeah. And uh, this account that you're giving is here at the end of that lengthy article as an addendum. Right. Okay. But I think it's very important uh, to read Father Chicada's opening to that addendum. He titles it Bishop Mendes and Bishop Lilly. Right? And he says, nothing rots like a lily. <clears throat> Typical of Father Jakarta flair of a little <laughs> sarcasm here. But this is what he says. I compiled the foregoing fact sheet about Bishop Mendez in 1995 only because Bishop Clarence Kelly and Father William Jenkins had long engaged in a campaign to unfairly vilify Archbishop Pierre-Martin Nodentuk. This they employed as grounds for dividing families in my parishes and for publicly refusing members' sacraments, based on nothing more than guilt by association, via yours truly, with things Archbishop Took had supposedly done in the 1970s or 1980s. <clears throat> I think this is really significant. I compiled the foregoing fact sheet about Bishop Mendez in the 1995 only because Bishop Clarence Kelly and Father William Jenkins had criticized Archbishop Took. So that's why I've decided to go after Bishop Mendez. Not because these are things that really are important or need to be known, but just as kind of a quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. In other words, I'm going to get him, getting back at them. They've attacked Bishop Mendez, so I'm motivated <clears throat> to go, and uh, they, they've attacked Archbishop Took, I'm sorry, They've attacked Archbishop Took, so that motivates me to attack Bishop Mendes. And I'm sorry to say that this was Father Chicago's, uh, this, this, this was his mentality. And it's unfortunate. It's, 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 it, it concerns me for his sake, actually. If that's why he decided to compile this so-called fact sheet about a Bishop Mendes, which is a lot of innuendo, a lot of anonymous testimony that somebody said, well, I heard Bishop Mendes say this, and I, I heard that Bishop Mendes did this, or I saw him do that, <clears throat> but there's no context given. On and on and on, paragraph after paragraph after paragraph. Whatever dirt he could find, he put, threw it in that, that so-called fact sheet, okay? Uh, would it stand up anywhere? I mean, the things that we talk about Archbishop Took having done are generally admitted that he did. He himself acknowledged having done them. People who are closest with him had first-hand knowledge of what he did and testified under oath of what he did. That's not what Father Chicada did here. His fact sheet is a scandal sheet. It's yellow journalism. <clears throat> and even this, even this addendum that he adds here about Bishop Mendez and Bishop Lilly, <clears throat> it's attributed to some, some writer who Father Chicada doesn't know uh, you know, who is, who is this, this guy who put this information together even and made these allegations, who wrote about this problem uh, that uh, this bishop was a homosexual? But, you know, even, even if it's true, even if it's true that the bishop who succeeded Bishop Mendez, personally chosen by Bishop Mendez to succeed him, was consecrated by Bishop Mendes and therefore installed by the Holy See at the time in, uh, in uh, Arecibo. Again, there is no comparison between the two. You mentioned the word knowingly. He was, no, he was openly, knowingly homosexual or implying that Bishop Mendes knew that he was homosexual. What evidence is there to show that, Archbishop, that Bishop Mendes knew this man was a practicing homosexual. There is no evidence given whatsoever. It's just assumed that he knew. Oh, well, he must have known. 
But you know, there were a lot of people in the seminaries back then who were, they were not known. They were undercover, right? And uh, Bishop Mendez himself had to send seminarians to uh, seminary. Uh, he had no seminary in Arecibo. He had to send any, whatever seminarians he had to stateside seminaries. We know for a fact that he went there, visited them, and pulled them out of there when he saw the liberalism, that, that he saw them snuffing their cigarettes out in the holy water fountains as they were going in for the church. <clears throat> Bishop Mendez himself told me that he, he said this is the kind of thing that was going on there that led him to pull the seminarians out of there. So we don't know. What, Archbishop uh, uh, Bishop Mendez never mentioned this man to me in any context whatsoever. Um, nor was anything said about him, to my knowledge, until Father Jakarta produces this, this statement um, by this, this writer about this. Uh, he gives, actually, the source of what he's writing, and you ask, well, who is this guy, and how credible is he? I mean, is he a real journalist, or is he just looking uh, to do another smear, you know? I mean, that's a, that's a very serious question, I think. Where is where's he getting this, and how reliable is it? <clears throat> He gives us one source. But here you have a case where a bishop succeeded Bishop Mendez, allegedly chosen by him to succeed him, or recommended by him to succeed him. And it turns out he was a homosexual and he was guilty of crimes against seminarians. Okay? Terrible thing. Terrible thing. Could you accuse Bishop Mendez of poor judgment? I suppose so. You know, if he knew. Uh, if, he, if he didn't know and should have known, if there were some way that he could have known this man's proclivities, I don't know. But to compare that to Archbishop Took consecrating Jean Labory is really absurd. I mean, Jean Labory had left the Catholic faith. He'd started his own church. He was a, a notorious, he was a notorious homosexual ad, activist in Paris. Archbishop Twick knew that Jean Labrie had left the Catholic Church and been consecrated as a bishop in a schismatic truth by, by his whiteness, Mark Tugdual II of the Celtic Church. Archbishop Twick knew that. That's why he conditionally consecrated Jean, Jean Labrie. He knew he'd already been consecrated outside the church. <laughs> this is a very different case here. I mean, even outrageously so. The fact that Father Jakarta would dare say, well, look, you know, our, uh, Bishop Mendez's um, <clears throat> hand-picked successor uh, was a homosexual and abused seminarians and was denounced and so on and so forth. And see, this is, this is just the same thing, same thing. That's, that shows the shallowness of his thinking. And I don't know that he was really a shallow thinker. I think he was moved... Uh, by a certain bias, and I think what he said in the beginning of this addendum is true. He was just doing this in retaliation, saying, well, if they're going to attack Bishop, uh, Archbishop Took and shake people's confidence in him, and by the way, for good reason, these are very serious things that he did that are uh, notorious and provable and, and actually proven Right? even to his supporters, that he did these things, <clears throat> that I'm going to do what I can to drag Bishop Mendes's name through the mud. And that this is an admission on, on, on uh, Father Jakarta's part that he can't defend Archbishop Tug. I can't answer these, these objections to what Archbishop Tug has done. I can't find a way to disprove them. I can't find a way to justify them. And the only thing I have left in my arsenal is to go after and attack Bishop Mendez. If everything Father Chicada said about Bishop Mendez were true, it wouldn't make Archbishop Took one bit better or worse. It wouldn't solve the problems with Archbishop Took. Not at all. It might make people think, gee, you know, I'm horrified by what Father Chicada says about Bishop Mendez. Well, if I'm horrified by what he says about Bishop Mendes, I, I guess I really should be horrified by what he says about Bishop Took, too. Logically, that's what they would do. But they're not thinking logically. Why? Because they're motivated by a certain revenge, sense of revenge, you know? just to get back, just to get back. 
And this is so sad because I think this is unworthy of Father Chiara to do that, really. And, uh, and it just makes me want to pray for him all the more, you know. Um, but he says to himself, the only reason I wrote this is because Bishop Kelly and Father, Ch uh, Father Jenkins have, uh, you know, uh, uh, he says, uh, he says, unfairly vilified uh, Archbishop Took, but he can't prove that there was unfair vilification because he can't show where we where were wrong, or what we said was not true, or why it's not important. It is important. Uh, so I think, really, this whole thing is an admission on his part. I'm doing everything I can uh, to undermine Bishop Mendes, and this is the best he can do. And right. Believe me, it's, it's nothing in comparison with the truth. There's no, no real evidence to show that Bishop Mendes was culpable for this. And there is a plenty of evidence to show. Uh, even from Archbishop Took's most ardent supporters, there's plenty of evidence to show that what he did was very wrong. Father, towards the end of that uh, amendum, uh, Father Chikata says that... Uh, you know, as Christians, we're supposed to be charitable to each other. So he says uh, that that he, he's willing to be to be uh, charity, show some charity towards Bishop Mendez, and kind of excuse uh, some of these some of these uh, charges that, that he's brought up here. Um, but but then he he says, uh, Father, you know, why why if he would be willing to do that, why couldn't you do the same thing for Archbishop Took? Why couldn't you uh, be, be view some of these things, some of these questionable things that Archbishop Took did? Um, why can't you view some of them in a more charitable light and uh, try and excuse some of them? How do you view in a more charitable light that he consecrates a notorious homosexual activist beer delivery man in Paris who actually left the church and began his own religion, his own church, and then conditionally consecrates him, thinking that if I can only conditionally consecrate him, that'll make him Catholic again. This is totally outrageous. It's, it's a crime against the church. Uh, there is no way to look at this in any other, I mean, uh, any other way than the truth itself. Uh, the truth speaks for itself. The only way to charitably look at the things that Archbishop Cook did was to say he was not thinking clearly, so he couldn't be responsible for what he did. That's the only charitable way to do it. And I'm willing to give him that. And uh, there, his closest supporters actually implied that that was the case. That in his case, that one of them actually said, one of the two men who were involved with these consecrations said, he had the mind of a child. He had cats walking on his altar in his apartment while he was saying Mass. Five cats were walking across the altar. He said that. He witnessed this. You know? um, and, you know, we interviewed them trying to find, well, first of all, trying to find the evidence, the testimony, that the correct matter form and intention were present there when he consecrated Archbishop Took did. And then uh, we tried failing that because they couldn't give us that. They could not give us the testimony to establish credibly that the proper matter, form, and intention were applied necessary to make a man a bishop. We did ask, well, why would he do such things? And their answer was, well, he had the mind of a child and he, he didn't think straight. He thought if he consecrated this, uh, this notorious, I, mean, I, 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 I say that notorious because he was well known to be um, of his actual, unlike you know, whatever evidence or lack of it Father Chicada has here about Father Bishop Mendez, um, that he thought that by conditionally consecrating him, he'd make him Catholic again. <laughs> There's no foundation for that. But I mean, also the fact that, you know, uh, uh, Father Gerard de Laurier did go to um, uh, Archbishop Took and, and ask him to certify that he, Archbishop Took, did not believe that John Paul II was a real pope. And Archbishop Took guaranteed to him, insisting that he did not recognize John Paul II as the pope. A week later, Archbishop Took is celebrating the new Mass in the cathedral in Toulon with the Bishop of Toulon, and celebrating the new Mass, says it was okay because he withheld his intention to consecrate, which is a sacrilege. And then a week later, he's consecrating 
uh, Gerard de Laurier in invoking John Paul II's name as authorizing the consecration. Now, this is from the men who are right there and working with him and trying to justify his consecrations and upholding them. That they're saying uh, under oath that he did these things. So again, I mean, the only, the only real charitable explanation for that, for a fact that he did, is to say, well, he, he was not thinking clearly and he wouldn't be responsible. You hope the crime was committed. That's a fact. You just hope that he wasn't responsible for the crime because that would be a terrible thing, <laughs> obviously, right? Um, so we're trying to be charitable in the only way possible. Um, it's not charitable to deny the facts. Well, charity comes in and trying to ascribe the motive. The problem is, you know, if you ascribe that motive out of charity, that he wasn't really responsible for what he was doing, because he wasn't in his right mind, then how does that affect the validity of his consecrations? Yeah. That raises another question, doesn't it? So inevitably, it's a dilemma with him. It's a dilemma. It was the fact is, he committed these crimes against the church. They are thoroughly testified to by those who are eyewitnesses, and even those who support and promote him. <clears throat> and so, looking at the facts, and the only question is, really, was he responsible or was he not responsible? Uh, the Nova Soda Church has judged what he did and condemned what he did. Um, if you say he was responsible, you say he's committed these terrible crimes, which are also terrible sins. If you say he wasn't responsible, then you try to absolve him of guilt, but you also raise the question of whether or not his consecrations were even valid. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see any tetium quid here. I don't see any, any other avenue to go down here. <clears throat> So, again, if Father Chikamata, again, appeals to that, well, let's be charitable and just overlook all this. Well, wait a minute, though. Here you slung, slung all this mud, right? And let's say, but in the end, let's be charitable and pretend this doesn't count. I'm sorry, but again, you're, all, you're off base. You're totally off base here. It's sad to say. That's not charity. Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah. I think we ought to move on here, Tom. It's sad. <laughs> but <clears throat> I would just, I guess, ask Father Chikata to the prayer list, too. Sure. <laughs> Oh, maybe briefly, Father, we could um, talk about something a little happier. Um, sort of mentioned charity. Uh, we did have a question about humility. Uh, one of our viewers wanted to know uh, that uh, if we talk about humility and uh, how that uh, entails acknowledging our own lowliness, our own sinfulness, um, if that's the case, if that's what humility uh, entails, then how, uh, how could we say that our lady, our Lord, how did they practice humility? They obviously uh, were without sin, so how could, they, uh, how could they practice humility? What would that look like in them? Well, if our lady and our Lord had repented of sin, what would that have made them? Sinners. Sinners, right? Because they were not guilty of sin. It would have been a lie. In a, in a great sense, it would have been a blasphemy. So they could not plead guilty to sin. Because humility is a matter simply of truth. Uh, it actually kind of ties in with what we're talking about here. <laughs> um, humility is acknowledging the reality. It is uh, having a, a just and, uh, and true estimation of one's own goodness and place in God's order of things. It, true relationship with God, a relationship with our fellow men. Okay? So for sinners, humility <clears throat> is acknowledging their sinfulness. For sinners, creatures like ourselves, humility is acknowledging our nothingness without the will of God creating us and sustaining us in reality. So for a, for a saint or a sinner to say, I am of myself nothing. I'm nothingness itself. My very existence I owe to Almighty God, who has willed me into existence, and whatever good there is in me, it, it is His work. And whatever failure that is in me is mine. 
whatever order is in me is God's order. And whatever disorder is in me is my own, my own failure. That's humility for a creature and a sinner. But even for a, even for a saint, it would still be humility to acknowledge that, because it's still true. <clears throat> now, it would not be humility for the Blessed Mother to repent of sin. Uh, because it would actually, she would actually, in that, be failing the truth and be failing uh, the reality of the greatness of the privilege of the Immaculate Conception. And, in a sense, establish herself as ungrateful for it. As though she herself was not even acknowledging that great privilege that God gave her. So for humility, humility for the Blessed Mother is acknowledging the Immaculate Conception as a privilege granted to her and being filled with gratitude to Almighty God. Yet she realizes that without that great privilege extended to her because of her vocation to be the mother of the Savior, she would be a sinner as the rest of us. But she wasn't a sinner as the rest of us because God preserved her that by a special, special grace. That's humility for a Blessed Mother. For our Lord, as the Son of God, and not only sinless, but as God, the, you know, infinite goodness, uh, for him to deny that in any way uh, would be blasphemy against his own divinity, really. So humility for the Son of God is being exactly who he is, exactly who he portrayed in the Gospel. Uh, I and the Father are one. The Father is greater than I. Our Lord refers to his divine person and his divine, uh, the Son. The Son refers to his divine person and his divine nature in one case, and he refers in the other to his human nature. Okay, the human nature he took. <clears throat> and so you see in the Gospels, our Lord referring to the greatness of God, the humility of, even of himself, uh, according to his human nature that he taught. Right. There we see humility. But there was no sin there. That's whatsoever. So, um, it was out of humility that the Blessed Mother and the Son of God made man himself did not repent of sin. It, they couldn't. Um, without being dishonest. And dishonesty is anathema to humility. But Our Lady says, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Behold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. That's not a boast. She follows it up with, For he who is almighty has done great things to me. Holy is his name. That is her humility speaking. That's her lowliness speaking. She attributes, she recognized the good that is there, and she recognizes it as God's work, not hers. That's true humility. What, what's the, uh, the Catholic de de definition of humility? Exactly. Well, if you look at St. Thomas Aquinas and the other uh, moral theology books, so they, they tell you that humility is a just estimation of who we are in relation to our Creator and who we are in relation to our fellow creatures. Okay. Now, I mean, there's a much more exact... Uh, I can look that up in Prummer if you'd like. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, essentially, uh, you know, the virtue it has to be based on truth, right? And if it is not based on truth, uh, then it is not true humility. Uh, so we have to actually, in a sense, you might say, humility enables us, the virtue of humility sees, enables us to see who we are in God's eyes, as God knows us. Mm -hmm. How, how did our Lord uh, illustrate humility and becoming man? Why do we say that he humbled himself to become man? How did that? Well, we even say, he emptied himself, uh, which is rather startling, thinking that the divine person of the Son of God from all eternity, kind of emptying himself out into this, into this human nature. But I mean, for the infinite, eternal, uh, God, in all of his goodness and his power, to take human nature and subject himself through that human nature to, um, to sinful mankind, to be spat upon by, to be beaten by, to 
be insulted by them. So, I mean, you can see humility in that. You can see how much our Lord humbled himself even to the death of the cross. <clears throat> it's hard to imagine. And he still humbles himself, even to the consecration at the Mass. It's almost inconceivable to think that the Son of God made man would leave us this as, you might say, his testament, right? This is the New Testament in my blood, he says, right? And he leaves us that. What is it? This holy, the Holy Eucharist himself, body and blood, to be for us the foundation of a sacrifice, his sacrifice in Calvary. That he leaves us that. I mean, in that we see a humility that is simply beyond the power of human understanding. The humility of God is inconceivable, inconceivably great. Um, but again, you might say, any humility of God has to be worthy of God. And so we see these rather spectacular displays of humility on the part of our Lord Jesus Christ. As St. Thomas says, on the cross, his humanity was all too evident. His divinity was hidden. But even in the host, even his humanity is concealed from us. Yeah. So he places himself again entirely in our power. It's a wonderful thing how great God is. Very good. Well, Father, thanks, uh, thanks again for being here. Thanks for uh, collaborating on these things. I appreciate your time. God Certainly. Bless you. Thank you. God bless you all, too. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima. Consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.